Welcome back to the latest episode of the Flex Success Podcast, where we teach you how to be less shit. As always, we will be your co-hosts. I'm Lizzie, and this is Dean. Now, if you find value in this episode, be sure to give us a like, subscribe, and drop a comment below on YouTube. Share us with your friends, give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast app, and if you want to take a screenshot and tag us on Instagram, just do that by putting in at flex underscore success. And while you're on Instagram, you can check out everything we offer from our eBooks to courses and programs. You can book a consultation or inquire about coaching via the link in our bio, or you can do that on our website. Enjoy the episode. Hey everyone. Today we have a lesson called Lessons from Getting Lean for You. I think it's lessons learned from getting lean. And it, I was really struggling with figuring out if it was lessons learnt with a T from getting lean or lessons learned ED from getting lean. I still don't know. I sort of chose one at random. Maybe it's learned. <laughs> lessons learned from getting lean. This is actually a replay, by the way, of something that we recorded over a year ago now. And we wanted to share it with you again either because you might not have listened to it or as a refresher because we got great feedback from it. The lessons are still applicable and it's just a goodie. It's an all-round goodie. But we wanted to record this quick video before we give you the replay to give you a personal update on what is going on. Yeah. What is going on, Dean? Well, back then I think it was near the beginning of my contest prep. Mm -hmm. And now we're surpassed that. We're past the contest. We are still in Portugal, though, for people that have listened to our most recent podcasts. Mm -hmm. uh, we are currently situated in Lagos. Spelled L-A-G-O-S, but pronounced L-A-G-O-S-H, mm -hmm. because they like to do that in Portuguese, don't yeah. they? Yeah, and I'm like, uh, I think, seven weeks this weekend, post-comp. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of lessons learned from getting lean. <laughs> there were a lot of lessons. <laughs> and here we are. So Dean and I, uh, for many, many years, had planned on living out of a suitcase, choosing a new place every three months, and we've done that for not that long. We're what, like six months in, something yep. like that. And um, gosh, there's a lot of the world to see, you know, really excited. And next stop is Croatia. But now we're actually thinking of getting a longer term visa. And we're thinking of trying to get the non-lucrative visa in Spain and renting something and staying there for six months of the year so that we can, I don't know about if your reasons are the same as me, Dean, but to establish some sort of home base so I can actually like fill the kitchen with things that I want to cook with and store my clothes when we go on weekend trips so I don't have to always lug like everything that I own with me uh, and just, just make it a little bit easier and just spend six months of the year moving around and six months in one place. Yeah, it also affords us the opportunity I chose that word appropriately, affords us the opportunity yes. to do weekend trips without it being a costly experience too, because when you stay somewhere for four weeks, it comes with a slight discount compared to four nights. Yeah. Okay. But having an elongated six month lease obviously gives us the best possible price so we can still afford to uh, shoot off on the weekend, check out different places, maybe choose the next place we stay at for six months. Mate, going from one country in Europe to another country is about the same price as an expensive lunch, honestly. It's so cheap. It's cheaper to fly from England to Portugal than it is to get a train from London to Northamptonshire <laughs> in England. That is so true. Trains in England were that's insanely so expensive. Uh, anyways, so that's what's happening with us. Yeah. We are in Portugal. We're considering a longer term stay in Spain, but we'll just see where the wind blows us. Plans might change. That's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. That is what we're doing. Yep, and I'm officially back to being a hobby builder. Officially. Yep. Hashtag hobby builder. <laughs> and without further ado, I present to you lessons learned, or is it learnt? Or is it learned to? Learn it from getting leaner. <laughs> Enjoy. We are talking about what today, co host Dean McKillop? Lessons learned from getting shredded. Well, no, you no. can talk Just about Just lessons getting... learned in the, like, from dying. Yeah, so I uh, have... But a, I mean, did you really die if you didn't get shredded? It's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> Lessons learned from trying to lose weight. Yes. So when I say I'm not getting shredded, it's because I'm not getting on a bodybuilding stage. So in comparison to competitors, you know, she jiggles a bit when she runs. But also, you're not a masochist that just wants to inflict pain on yourself. No, no. I really like ice cream. I really do. Um, yeah, so we thought we'd run through lessons from getting lean. For me, it's losing about five kilos. For Dean, it's getting inside out peel. Which could equate to nearly 20 cakes. Is it? Nah, probably. Um, 
No, more like 15, because I think you started your last prep at 100-ish kilos, and then you ended up 85 on stage. Stop telling people I was 85. So was easy, you were, though. No, I wasn't. Yes, you were. I was 89.8 kilos at weighing. Oh, my bad. That was my okay. first cup. Okay. Progression. Progression. Okay. Now, um, it'll be about, it'll, it'll probably be 20 kilos of weight lost by the time we take all the food out of my belly. But well, we're talking about in your next, this prep. next prep. yeah. 20 kilos, you reckon? I reckon 114 down to about 95, followed by refueling up to about 97. Okay. So really, it'll only be, what's that? 17 kilos. Well, you'd be an expert at this now because this won't be your first comp prep mm. anymore. Yeah, that's my guess. Yeah. Well, um, I have a, a little list I've written down, but maybe we'll start with your list. And if we end up doubling up on our lessons learnt from getting mm -hmm. lean, I'll cross mine off so we don't repeat them. Yeah. All right. So as you said, one of my uh, advantages here is I've done two contest preps. In the first contest prep... We've well, done two seasons. Yeah. Yeah, but you've done more than two comps. Two contest preps, though, I'm saying. Okay. Two seasons, yeah. Um, first season was I had a lot of food variety, which made me very food focused. And what I've learned is having less variety from a day to day basis, not necessarily in your meals, you still have to enjoy your food, made the dieting process a lot easier because it was more about just completing the task of consuming the food that I'd already pre prepared, as opposed to thinking about what I wanted every day, mm. which. Depending on your emotions can change a lot. And it's stressful trying to think about what to eat. So that's my tip for that one. Actually minimize the variety of food throughout the day mm -hmm. to maximize time and also um, the ease of eating. Yeah, to give an example of how much variety Dean was having in his day, he'd set himself a like, calorie cap for breakfast because he still wanted lunch, dinner and snacks. And he'd have a three course breakfast within those calories. I don't remember what it was. It was like oats and fruit, oats and berries you'd finish on. And then yeah. it was like kangaroo sausages and eggs. Yeah. And it was usually yeah, two courses minimum, sometimes three. But I would wake up every day and get on my fitness pal and determine what I wanted to eat for the day. You spent a lot of time on that goddamn and then I, And then I would cook it for the day. Then I'd go to work. And then I'd come home before I go to bed. I'd try and figure out what I wanted to eat the next day. And then I'd modify it the morning that I was walking. Mm, there was a lot of energy spent on, on yeah, that. Yeah, it made it way harder. Mm. Yeah. Whereas last prep, I just prepped food on a Sunday for the week ahead, minus dinner. I cook dinner fresh every night and sometimes change it, but I pretty much ate the same thing for at least seven days in a row. And then I would only modify out what I was finding difficult to consume little amounts of or that were boring. Mm. But you would still, even within eating the same thing, quote unquote, sometimes it might be green beans, sometimes it might be broccoli, sometimes it might be asparagus. Like there was still a variety within the boundaries of the same food, right? Uh, every meal every day would be the same as the day prior, mm -hmm. fruits, vegetables included, but I would probably have five different meals per day. Okay. So I had variety in the day, but no variety from day to day. Gotcha. All right, what's the next one? Um, follow a daily task or routine if possible. So it's non-food related, but I think the more you can be routine in your life, the less you'll have time to think about the same food as well. Okay. Um, it just makes it easier for time to be passed mm -hmm. and to become less food focused. Because mm -hmm. your mind's on other things. Yeah, so I would set up a routine for the day that would allow me to do a lot of things and then I would eat at certain times because that was the time that I allocated a window, not a, not like 1101. It was like somewhere between 11 and 12. Okay. Um, third one for me is to opt for larger meals less frequently with higher protein boluses um, or serves than doing the frequency game. The more frequent I found that you would try and eat meant the smaller the meals would be and the lower the satiety would be post meal. I think this is actually probably super pertinent to females more so than males. Mm -hmm. Males, not because of the sex differences, but just because of body size. Males are typically eating more protein, so we can get away with like even five or six meals of a fairly decent chunk of protein, which is quite satiated. Mm. Whereas females have limited protein requirements from a grams perspective because of their body weight, which means you have less protein per meal. Mm -hmm. And doing 20 grams of protein five times a day, boring. Not very filling. And also super unsatiated. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. Less frequent, larger, protein dominant meals. Mm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, but this is just things that seem to be working well for you. For other people, yeah. they might find that they prefer to eat more frequently because they just can't stand the feeling of being hungry, Absolutely. which is one of my tips, actually. But yeah. I'll get to that later. This is the joy of this is that you have to appreciate there's a large psychological component to the dieting phase, and you really have to be able to pick and choose uh, which part of these tips may or may not benefit you. Because mm. you're, you're right. I have some clients that would prefer to eat seven meals a day than to eat four meals a day. 
And it's because they're like, I get to eat every two hours. It's easy. I only yeah. have to wait an hour and a half by the time I'm Well, finished. they get full easily. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. You eat a piece of toast and get full. Um, my other one is a, a tip that I found in prep was to try and place a workout in the space of where a meal would normally be consumed. Okay. Um, so, or somewhere in that vicinity. So let's just say you're eating every four-ish hours. I would try and train at around the three and a half hour mark because I knew that would actually get me to around about five and a half hours by the time I got home, six hours. So it extended that window of where I, I wouldn't go without food for six hours, just walking around. But when I was training, I was full on fluids, water. Mine was somewhere else. Mine was somewhere else. And it meant that I could have those larger meals less frequently. Mm. Um, that's how I kind of factored the both of them in together. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I put, I put a, uh, a training session in the middle or even not quite. Or, or close to when you want to eat so it can push that food window. Yeah, back. like half an hour before I know I'm going to get hungry. Do you get hungry when you train? Is that, do people do that? Look, it depends. Sometimes when I'm lifting, I get really hungry, maybe because it's just arms or something. But if I'm doing jujitsu, no chance. Yeah, like, no. I can spend three hours there, you know, in, and plus the time it takes me to get there and get home and chat time mm. or whatever. And I'm not hungry at all. I think it's just the adrenaline of someone trying to choke me. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to swallow an apple when you can't breathe. Yeah, <laughs> but like at the gym, I think like there's there's rest time between sets. And, mm. Yeah, I um, I'm also one of the people that get hunger shut down majorly post workout. So like, I'm quite comfortable not eating after a training session for a good hour. Mm -hmm. So like, really, that window would be quite extensive for me. Yeah. Uh, is that four? I don't know. I haven't been counting. Uh, my, I think it's going to check my list. Yeah, my last one is um, to actually consume larger amounts of fluids with your meal as opposed to in between your meals. Mm -hmm. Uh, this was something that I just found personally was better. comes down to the concept of like the mechanism of shutting down hunger by having a full stomach. Mm. Um, you get some feedback loops to go back to the brain that says stomach is full. Stop, stop sending out those hunger hormones. Because mm -hmm. food and liquid goes to the same place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I had this sort of notion of this, this hunch, I guess you could say, that doing a large bolus of water in between meals perhaps wasn't the greatest idea because I'd used that as a method in a water cut strategy for fighters in the past, knowing that if we can fill the stomach up with water in one big shot, it'll empty faster. Um, and if you do that mid meal, it makes it made no sense to me to feel full for 30 seconds to then have that water pass to then feel empty again. I mean, I, I, um, I may be misquoting this, but hopefully not. I remember there's a, a little paper that Jackson Pios actually just referenced on his social that he put up the sort of tidbits for. And one of them was that people that had bolus of waters in between in large amounts of meals actually were inclined to eat more at the next meal because they got hungrier because of that shift of gastric emptying, mm. um, which kind of validated just a hunch that I had and the what I felt personally. So if you are going to consume water, you're best to consume a large quantity of it with the meal as opposed to intra-meal or in between meals because you may just get hungrier from the release. Large amounts though is like a subjective For sure. measure. So we wouldn't want to be doing anything that actually limits you from consuming your minimum daily requirements of protein and vegetables and fruit, mm. or that maybe well, disrupts I would have digestion. After. I would have the water after the meal too. That would be one thing I would say. For right. Sure. So get your food in first. Eat your food, then have your water, fill your stomach up, take some breaths, wait for that hunger signal to kick in. But it would still be in. considered with the meal because the yes. time frame that it's, even though it's after the meal, it's still like directly. Let's say on top of. On top of. Okay. Yeah. Whereas in addition to. Yeah. Um, still sipping water throughout in between meals is perfectly fine. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think it would be potentially advantageous for people to try and fill up on water in between. Mm. Hmm. I think that's my five. Okay. I didn't even have a bonus one. Usually you throw bonuses, but... Yeah, well, maybe you'll think of some. So mine aren't in any particular order, um, but it would be worth maybe mentioning that coincidentally this morning, Flex Success Coach Tom posted in the private... Um, group for flex success clients and coaches about he lost like 13 and a half kilos recently yeah and he wasn't a big man no he wasn't he's focusing on running at the moment i think like yep he's going to do a 50k long, yeah i was going to say um, long distance run i think it's a charity event so he's doing a 50 kilometer run soon so yeah he's just been exposing himself to more and more kilometers on the road mm. plus he used to play rugby mm. and he lifts squat bench dead as his preferential lifts to be stronger because he's a power lifter. Um, so one thing he mentioned was the idea of front loading protein and fiber. Mm. And 
there's, you know, this idea, which isn't necessarily bad, but might be problematic, where if you have a social event coming up and you want to consume a little bit more, maybe um, a meal that is higher in calories plus some alcohol on top of that, you might want to fast leading up to that meal or just have a very small amount of food or calories um, before that meal. And Tom was saying that perhaps that isn't such a good idea because what we're doing is then exposing ourselves to very delicious or hyper palatable foods and also liquid calories, which aren't really very filling either, when we're really hungry. And it's very difficult to restrain ourselves when we're feeling really hungry. So maybe a better idea is to choose lower energy dense foods beforehand. So that would be lean proteins and fibrous non starchy vegetables so that you enter um, the event with kind of tempting foods around, feeling quite full or at least not starving. So it's easier to eat less. Yeah, you've done this before. Yeah, I- Plenty of times we've gone out for dinner, you're like, I'm just gonna have myself a protein shake mm. and I'm gonna eat a carrot on the way. It's something that I do very frequently. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so another term you might've heard of is before it's preload, right? I call it preloading, Tom yeah. called it front loading. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same, but different. Same, same, but totally. different. Yeah, um, when I was writing about preloading, I you know, obviously looked at the research beforehand. And one thing that uh, shone through was that preloading can actually increase the amount of calories people are eating if they're choosing um, calorie-dense foods to preload on. Oh. So if they have you know, a donut beforehand or a glass of orange juice or... I don't know, something that's a little heavier in calories than mm. a punnet of strawberries or a couple of carrots or a protein shake or something, their total calories consumed is greater. Yeah, probably not the best so choice. Pretty <laughs> loading. Choose fresh fruit and veggies. <laughs> the weather's, you know, it's the opposite. Right? You eat some vegetables or even I think fruit has been quoted in the research as well, protein mm -hmm. prior to a meal and then give those people the opportunity to eat ad libitum more freely. They typically eat less calories total in the seating, in the sitting, including the preload, uh -huh. than what those that just go into it and eat ad libitum without a preload. Yeah, eating to hunger would be yeah. another way to. Yeah, which is cool to say. It. Yeah. Um, all right. So my list. Uh, Dean mentioned having a like a routine, and that was one of my points as well to establish a base, because when you go into a cut, you need to be quite strict on the things that you do in general, your sleep, your exercise, your nutrition, your stress management. And if we go from having absolutely no routine to having to be quite strict on ourselves, like good luck with that. That's going to be very challenging. Um, and you might slip off the bandwagon one too many times that you give up. So I think starting at a place where you're already in helpful habits and you just tighten those habits up a little bit will go a long way. Mm -hmm. um, my other point was remind yourself that hunger isn't an emergency. I think a lot of the time very new clients come on board and they feel hungry and their caveman brain says, ah, oh, starvation. And then they just kind of snap. But if we use some mindfulness techniques and just remind ourselves, I'm feeling hungry right now, but I know I have a meal coming up in about an hour and a half. Mm. Um, nothing bad is going to happen. If I feel hungry, worst case scenario, I can have a diet Coke or a diet jelly or something like that if I really want to get rid of this feeling for yeah. now. Yeah, or so, even some veggies, like you said, too. Yeah, some veggies. Mm -hmm. um, I um, I always say to my contest prep athletes that they have to essentially become one with hunger. <laughs> okay, you know? do you use those words? <laughs> I may have in the past. <laughs> oh I, don't, I don't know if I've actually ever used Sorry. those. No, I, I tell them to acknowledge hunger and recognize that it's a reality, but it's never going to go away. So you just have to be okay with it and be at peace with it. Yeah. And the, the less you can focus on the fact that you're hungry and therefore that is negative, the easier it becomes to ignore it. Mm. Um, like, if anything, it's a positive indication that you're eating, you know, an in insufficient amount of calories to maintain your body weight, which is what your intention is. So, um, <coughs> I was going to say, I'm willing, to, I'm willing to bless you, but you held on to your knees. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I, uh, I am a big on at least that. Yeah, I think it is a fair kind. Become one with hunger. Become one. Yeah, but it just sounds so dicky. Become one with hunger. Who down. are you, Yoda? Sit there. Um, yeah. Yoda? I don't Is Yoda know. meditative by nature? He's, he's quite philosophical. Neither of us watch South Park. What is it? <laughs> Not South Park. I know Star Wars. It's Star Wars. I'm a big fan, guys. 
Oh, Dean hates Star Wars. You hate it so much. They made me watch it at school. I fell asleep. Um, I want to give it another shot as an adult. I mean, they did it as a child and I don't think I could appreciate the symbolisms and metaphors. I would rather watch... I don't like sci-fi, but I'm willing to give it a go. I'd rather watch Nacho Libre, which looks like a terrible movie. <laughs> Actually, you know what? One of my clients, shout out to Will from America... Suggested was it ludicrous? Is that what it was called? Oh, a TV show oh. on Netflix. I thought it was hilarious. Will, you've got terrible taste. He <laughs> doesn't. It was so funny. It's what's that dude's name? Oh, uh, the Chris? guy from Summer Heights High. Also a shit show. No, it's not. It's a terrible show. I just don't. I can't be impressed by dumb humor. But it's not dumb humor as much as it is like awkward, which is why it's so think... funny. Like, Eddie Murphy did himself in multiple different characters in, like, The Nutty Professor, right? Uh-huh. But he did it like a pro. Okay. You can't tell that he's them, unless you really look. No, it's... Old mate, old mate over in Summer Heights High just puts a dress on and calls himself a woman. It's so funny. And he looks... Te- and he's, got, he's a really bad actor. He's not. And he's not a comedian. Um, well, we'll agree to disagree there, Dean. Agree to disagree. Look, for the sake of... <clears throat> oh, yeah, all right. We're so going to break up over this. <laughs> Um, my next point, did, was I like in the middle of something? Actually, if it? anybody's listening to this and they agree with me or agree with Liz, take a screenshot and then say on the social media and tag us and say Summer Heights High sucks, you know. Or Summer Heights High rocks. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's see, Dean. Let's see what the people have to say. The people will speak. If there's more people on your side of the fence, I'm going to have to assume our audience isn't that smart. <laughs> Whatever, Dean. <laughs> I apologize for offending you all. I can laugh at dumb things and still be intelligent. You do laugh at me, so. <laughs> it's true. It's true. All right. Um, so my other one was periodize, which has nothing to do with periods. Um, we a difficult time to uh, deal with cravings, though. It is a very difficult time to do. Actually, this kind of ties into it. So in my cut right now, um, I'm cutting for a handful of weeks leading into a photo shoot. And when I am on my period, I feel very hungry and I have really strong cravings and I knew that I am willing and able to sustain any amount of discomfort and hunger if I wanted to but if I can reduce how uncomfortable something is why wouldn't I and so what I did is I over an eight week period I've of time I factored not an eight week period could you imagine eight week period of time I factored in two diet week breaks where I brought calories up to about maintenance calories and I chose um, my two periods, like menstrual cycles, to do that because they're the times that I want more food. Um, But I mean, for boys listening or girls who don't get your period or girls who do but don't get high cravings, it still might be a good idea to factor in a couple of refeed weekends or just some moments where you're having a break from dieting so you don't experience diet fatigue to a point where you're going to snap mm-hmm. so periodize and we periodize everything like when we go to the gym for an hour you're not working out at 10 out of 10 intensity the whole time like you take rests between sets so that you can repeat your performance or when you work for the working week you're not there for five full days you go home and rest and come back the next day so i think of diet breaks and refeeds as just sort of like a pressing the restart button and making sure that you can repeat the performance before mm-hmm. you break Yep. Yeah, Period eyes. Yeah. I think there's a lot of fear around momentary increases in calories because people assume that means fat gain. But if you don't consume a sufficient amount of calories above what you require, yep. you're only ma- you're still maintaining the physique you've just created. Okay, math you're looks just, like this. Yeah. I can maintain current body weight on about two thousand calories. In order to lose weight, I want to drop my calories to about fifteen hundred, maybe a little lower, depending on how fast I want to lose. When I'm taking a diet break for those two weeks over my periods, I just increase calories to about 2,000 calories. Yeah. That's all. I'm just no longer in a deficit. I, but I'm not eating in a surplus. I'm not eating um, in a surplus of 2,000, so fat gain isn't possible. Mm-hmm. And I'm maintaining my daily movement. So even though I'm changing my consumption, I'm not changing my output, we just want to play with as minimal variables as possible. It's good. Yeah. Plus, psychologically, it'll make the dieting process a little bit easier, mm. both uh, anecdotally and now in the research. Indeed. So, 
Dean, you mentioned um, reducing variability mm -hmm. because you would spend so long on my fitness pal, deciding what to eat and it took a lot of energy. One of my points, I'm going through these in random orders. Mm -hmm. It's actually the third point I wrote down and <laughs> it's not the third point. I didn't I do mine in order either. Didn't you? No. Um, it's, the, it's a wild The thing. KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple, sexy. I don't know what else. Salad. Keep it, is it keep it simple, salad? Whatever you want the S to sound for. Keep it Does that make simple. all Sally's inherently stupid now though? Like Karen's are all bitches. <laughs> oh man, I feel so sorry for anyone called grief. Karen. Bob's are definitely the guy who uh, cuts the grass at the school. He's a Bob. <laughs> I guess so. Um, you look like a man. The best Instagram page ever. You guys should check it out. There's a lot of like men giving unsolicited opinions on women's bodies. Like, you know, they're sick powerlifters and they're like, oh, I don't find that very sexy. Yeah, mate, because she's a powerlifter to be sexually appealing to you. Okay. Um, they call any of those guys Gary. Oh, Gary. Gary. So like, oh, another Gary here. I, I knew a really nice Gary University lecture though. But he did do skin folds, so maybe just a bit creepy. Ooh. No, he definitely was not creepy. He was did awesome. he do like your ball sack? No. Are you sure? There was definitely no scrotal <laughs> pinching. <laughs> <laughs> you, how would you take that pinch? Oh, it would be very painful. On your back, I reckon. Do you think you'd lay on your back and spread your knees? Yeah, hold, just hold it up like you're having a baby. Oh, Gary definitely would do that pinch. <laughs> We're adding a new oh, site to the <laughs> <laughs> Where is this podcast going? <laughs> um, yeah, so mine was the same, along the same lines as reducing variability. Keep it simple. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to keep it very boring or you have to hate your food, but just realize that for now it's actually helpful to reduce the pal palatability of your food mm. so you find it enjoyable enough so that you're not gagging on your meals but not so pleasurable that you find your meals triggering and you just can't stop eating yeah um and so choosing things like strawberries with a bit of natvia chocolate topping it's definitely not the greatest chocolate out there but it's something the calories are so low um or maybe just a diet soft drink just for something sweet in the afternoon. Just really simple, mm -hmm. reducing the time you're spending in the kitchen. What you don't want to do is play the IIFYM macro tracking game using like zero calorie protein fluff and all of these diet foods and combining some, yeah. some concoction and you're like, oh, this for only 150 calories. It's probably not going to keep you full for very long. You're going to spend so much time in the kitchen, mental preoccupation with food is only going to be increased. Just have a bloody Coke Zero, not a Pepsi Max. <laughs> yeah, or well, just don't, don't, shoot, don't try and chase pregnant belly. Yeah. There actually is some association too in the research in regards to the volume of food not aligning with the like relative expected calories of that food. Mm. So protein fluff's a perfect one. Like it's just a bunch of xanthan gum that blows up your stomach and makes you feel like you're going to explode. Yep. But for very, very little calories. Mm. And essentially it's just as like, this isn't normal. This isn't natural. And it doesn't actually help with shutting down those feedback mechanisms typically. So mm. you're only making your digestive system more like less resilient for one. And then two, it's, it's going to like be mixed messaging in by nature, I suppose you could say in that you'll feel full, but you'll still be hungry. Mm. Um, and then that fullness then will like move into the next meal, which then you'll have digestive distress and then that causes more problems. And you, the, the thing I've found with people that chase fullness 24 seven when they're hungry, hungry is that the fullness actually reminds you that you want to eat because mm. you can feel your belly the entire time. Yeah. I mean, we definitely want to choose foods that are going to help us stay fuller for longer. So lean proteins, fibrous, non-starchy vegetables, mm -hmm. fresh fruit, um, because of their energy density, very low energy density and the fiber. But when you're dieting, hunger is just sometimes part and parcel of that. Yeah. Um, and I found I can physically feel full, but hedonically I'm hungry. Like I've just finished a meal. My stomach feels full. I don't actually think I want to eat any more food, but I could punch someone in the face for a square of chocolate. Yeah. Like I just have cravings. And I think it's important to differentiate. Say this word for me. Differentiate. That one. Um, I don't know why it's such a tongue tie for me right now. Differentiate. Yeah, Does that? All right. <laughs> um, between cravings and hunger. And sometimes it smacks me in the face uh, like a slap. And I'm like, oh, I'm so hungry. Wait, hunger comes on slowly. It builds over time. Anything will get rid of it. 
but this is obviously a craving because it's come on quickly. If I had steamed broccoli in front of me, I wouldn't eat it yeah. because what I want right now is tr- that's a craving. Um, and, and there's things that we can do to help get over cravings like urge surfing, which we've spoken about in, in a previous episode. Mm. Um, but on this topic, I guess other mindfulness techniques that's worth talking about is eating slowly without distraction because I could eat a whole big bowl of food quickly and once it's over, I'm like, oh, I'm still hungry, didn't really enjoy it. Or I could chew each, chew each mouthful, swallow it before I pick up more on my fork, spread that meal out over 20 minutes. Um, you know, Smaller utensils, chopsticks. Mm-hmm. Chopstick soup, difficult. <laughs> Maybe not for soup. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not for soup. Yeah. Yeah, so slow it down, eat without distraction, enjoy your food, don't eat it mindlessly. Yep, they're, they're massive. Yeah. Because when you're hungry, you're ravenous, and typically that's when you just inhale food. And mm. Again, you end up potentially with some digestive distress, and then that distress just reminds you that you're hungry, and it's a pretty vicious circle. Yeah, totally. I haven't written this one down, but it's just one that comes to mind because I actually found it really useful today. Um, I really want ice cream and chocolate today. I don't know why, but like it's just being on my mind. And it's not that I can't eat it. I can eat it, but that will come at the cost of what I'm able to eat later today. And I know I'm really going to regret using those calories Mm -hmm. on a handful of food that feels good now and suffer for it later. So instead of me saying, I'm not eating it today, stop thinking about it. I'm not going to eat it. I'm just saying, I am just not going to eat it before my next meal. If I really want it after my next meal, Maybe I'll think about eating it then. But actually what I plan on doing is I probably do want to eat it after that meal. I'll just say, look, I'm just not going to eat it before until dinner. The next meal. Yeah, until the next meal. Yeah. And just, just push it back a little bit. And that way it doesn't feel like an emergency. It doesn't feel like it's totally off the cards. It's just not now. Mm. Yeah, that's a good one. Thank you. I like it. I was going to say, talk about, I was going to call them fake foods. And I thought I'd call them faux foods. What's that? Or fox foods, <laughs> <if> someone <would> say. <laughs> who, who would say that, Dean? What <laughs> idiots? Go on. <laughs> I came, I came home from Big W. I bought, we, Dean and I um, made our kitchen table and we made some stools and they were beautiful, but the stools were wood and they were just hard and I don't know. They needed something. So I mm. came home from Big W with this furry runner to go on the stool, some, some beautiful pink fox fur. Is what you called it, yeah. Is, <laughs> and I went... There's no, so, there's no way she paid for real fox fur. Well, no, I wouldn't buy animal that products. Too. Yeah, and yeah, it was F A U X. I'm not fucking French. Do I look French? Oui, oui. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. faux foods, which is minimise them, if not eradicate them, they'll never satisfy you as much as you think they will. They won't. Um, these would be like a, a flash round. Don't over rely on chewing gum. That will also just give you that negative feedback loop in regards to gastric distress. And bloating if you do it enough. And then it'll remind you. Um, but you know what? In saying that, love me some Ribena. If I got a blood test, it would say 100% yeah. Ribena um, because I add a little bit in my water. Yeah, I don't find those to be problematic for most people. It's yeah. usually the edible foods because they require a lot more volume in right, and in the sugar alcohols and mm-hmm. the xanthan gums and all that sort of stuff to actually make them palatable. Yeah, yeah, all right. Um, those, like, as much as you want spaghetti as the type of food, even those foods like the edamame, spaghetti and all the rest of it are super high in fiber and super high in um, protein. 15% protein. Like they're great for people that aren't big meat eaters. Yeah, this is like Slendia pastas we're talking about right now, by the way. But I would suggest that if you really like the noodle, try not to have a full serve of the noodle, but rather have a half serve with like zucchini ribbons. Yeah. I'm going to call them ribbons, not not noodles, zucchini noodles, zoodles. Um And bulk it out that way because every vegetable is still better from a volume perspective than any fake food. It's just that you may want to have a noodle-like consistency food. Mm. Um, but don't go for the whole serve because you're probably better off getting a, a meat protein, if you don't mind, from a satiety perspective and from a muscle retention amino acid perspective, probably a little bit better too. Um, and you also won't end up with an abundance of fiber in your diet to the point where you just have to feel pregnant all the time. Yeah, it depends. Like if somebody's a vegetable avoider, that could be yeah. a good time to eat it. But for most people who are eating at least a minimum amount of vegetables per day and maybe doubling or tripling it when you're in a dieting phase. Mm. Probs not a good idea. Yeah. So again, yeah. like these are, this is all just considerations for lessons learned from dieting that you can consider. Mm-hmm. Funny how that word worked. Eh? 
Did. Um, and you can, you know, make this more personal to yourself because mm-hmm. all of these are just options. Yep. Totes. Yeah. Love it, Dean. Totes my goats. Totes my goats. That sounds like you're toasting a goat though. <laughs> let's not toast a goat. <laughs> all right. Um, so let's wrap up, Dean. Something worth sharing. What have you got for me? I'm not good at being put on the spot. We didn't um, think about our something we're sharing no. on the podcast. Ooh. Yesterday, by the way, guys, speaking of being put on the spot, Dean and I were uh, guests on, was it the Platform, the platform. Podcast? podcast? And they asked me to describe myself in 21 words or less, and I did a terrible job. Yeah. <laughs> it was bad. It was so bad. I didn't even say coach. Every word counted, and she kept saying um. And laughing, yeah. and apparently, like, um, noises. noises count as words. Yeah. She didn't do very good. Oh, I didn't. All right, something with Sharon go. I knocked it out, but I don't remember that happening, Dean. I remember you being better than me, but still pretty fucking average. I got it done in less than twenty-one words, and then I, I had words. Oh, left. you used seven words. You're I like, words I'm an online coach. No, I didn't it's say like, oh, you said. <laughs> I said online coach specializing in contest preparation. Did you forget to mention your son Ruben? And then good all-round human. You did not say that. <laughs> I'm a coach. Uh, Something it's... worth sharing. Um, I've got nothing. You got nothing. No. Well, I mean, I've been uh, a member on, I'll do two memberships. That we, but we've, I think we've spoken about these before. Like I'm a member on Victor Black's um, website, which is great for people that are interested in pharmacology. Mm-hmm. And then I'm a member now on uh, the Physique Collective, which is Joe Jeffrey, my coach's um, group of, Coaches, and they've got a, a, a space now too, which is like seven pound a month. Cool. And it's not just pharmacology, like it's everything. So I'm actually um, doing my progress log on there for my prep as well. Cool. So what does that look like? Uh, it's just a check-in for me once a week. People can see like what my food's like, training. And do you see other picks. people's logs? Yeah, and then people are putting them up there. The coaches put them up there. So if you're interested in following my progress there, I'll still be putting some on the ground, of course. Okay, my something worth sharing would have to be that in the last two weeks, I've really enjoyed um, making this kind of like tomato-y sauce like you would make for a bolognese, but just without the meat. Sauce. Sauce, mm. a tomato sauce. So it's just like tin tomatoes, whatever vegetables are in the fridge. So yesterday it was like eggplant, leek, uh, carrots, zucchini, I think. Mm. And then tin tomatoes, herbs, and some garlic as well. And then I just keep that in the fridge and then it just spices up my meal. So if I'm having boiled potatoes, I'll just put, and I'll reduce it down so it's like a thick sauce, put it on my potatoes or I'll have it on rice if I'm having rice or I'll add it on cauliflower rice. Um, yeah, so it's been a good way just to eat plain foods but make it a little bit tastier mm. for minimum food prep time. So that's my something we're sharing. Make a veggie sauce. It's good. I've definitely done that before. Mm-hmm. What else we got? Uh, random questions. Okay. We haven't thought of any random questions. Well, I'll think of some on the spot. Dean, would you rather never be able to get a haircut again? I just got one today. And it looks beautiful. You look so beautiful today. Mm. You can trim your beard and whatnot, but just not your head hair. Mm-hmm. Never be able to get your hair cut again. Or never be able to wear shorts that are an appropriate length. They're either like Michael Jackson long, like just weirdly off mm-hmm. the ground, but not pants, or short, short, hot pants. I'd wear those. I'd rather wear the inappropriate shorts. Would you? Yeah. Why? Wow. Because they're weird length. Yeah. Would. So would my hair at some point. Yeah. And also it's fashionable to be unfashionable now. Yeah. Like people See, are actively going out of their way to look terrible. Okay. And then claiming it to be fashionable. All right. I got one then. I know. I've got one for you. Okay. Would you rather never cut your nails again? Or never be able to shave again. Oh well, I can laser or wax. No, 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 no removal of hair. Well, fuck. Because not cutting my nails means I couldn't do jujitsu. It means I couldn't type. How would I put my contacts in and out with long nails? I don't know. All right, I guess I. Ah, uh, but I have a <laughs> monobrow if I don't pluck my eyebrows, like a legit Arab woman monobrow. I'd be less worried about the monobrow than the arms and legs. No, because I'm thinking I'll move to a cold country, so I'm always covered up. I shan't be moving with you, though. Fuck. Oh, i got to cut my nails. It would limit my life too much. I'm being a hairy woman. A mm. oh, woe man. A woe man. Yeah. Yep, that's what I'm doing, Dean. All right. Cool. Cool. So, uh, thanks for listening. Is this our wrap-up? 
Yeah. What so, have we, what have we got to tell people at the end of our podcast, Liz? Oh, please like and subscribe. <laughs> share, share with your friends if you like this podcast. No, in all seriousness, we would appreciate you taking a screenshot and tagging us, sharing it on social media, getting the word out. Tag the both of us, tag the business. Well, the most important thing is to tag Flex. Yeah. But tag us if you'd like. Yeah. And we'll reshare that shit. Make you famous. <laughs> no promises. <laughs> Definitely no promises. Thanks, right. everyone. Bye. Yeah.